Honestly, it's true, false, and multiple choice. And I will tell you right up front that it's not, the tr it's not tricky questions. You know, it's not, um, I think you'll find a lot of it intuitive. And you guys did very well collectively on that essay exam. So I think you've got a solid foundation. I don't think you need to be real nervous about this. I think we'll do enough. Well, I think we'll, as long as you study the terms on the study guide, I would recommend going back to the textbook and reviewing the appropriate sections in the chapter um, to that. But I'm anticipating that you'll, you will collectively do very well on this. Is it like common sense stuff? I think so. <laughs> I mean, I think it is. I don't so, think, like I said, I don't think it's designed to be, it's, it's not, uh, it's not designed to, to be super difficult. It's designed to say, do you understand the basic concepts of project management? So we probably don't even need to study. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> that's what we're doing today. Um, okay, well, that's different. If you're like my son, whose vision of PowerPoints, and this is one reason I don't hand out PowerPoints in any of my classes, by the way, is his vision of studying is only looking at the PowerPoints and never reading the, the textbook. And you probably, that's probably not your best advice. That's all I'm saying. For this test? Yeah, they're meant to supplement. <laughs> some of this textbook, you know, there's some of it I know is really, um, like, you don't have to worry about the crystal ball stuff, the simulation stuff. If you understand the philosophy behind why we do simulations, that's all you need to know. But the, some of this stuff's actually quite entertaining. It is. If you read, for example, this chapter, this first chapter, we're talking about chapter four. I mean, the guy, the authors actually have a sense of humor. Some things in here. Okay, he says, project cost estimator gives a more optimistic picture than reality warrants. Inevitably, the estimate uh, estimator under, estimates the cost. This is a clear violation of PMI's code of ethics. It is also stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how, how much, I mean, I, I like the, the style is very direct. I mean, it might be a textbook, but they say, hey, this is, you know what I'm saying, it's more a practical approach than it is a bunch of theoretical stuff. So it's not overwhelming. I said, I'll, you know, and feel free to ask me, what you don't need to focus on as well, and I'll try to help you along the way understand that. Like I said, the crystal ball stuff, don't worry about that. Um, but one thing that the point they make right up front, and, and I, I do also like about this class how this is segmented. The first three chapters, I think, appropriately fit together. Four, five, and six, I think, very appropriately fit together. And, and for no other reason than what they say and what might make it seem a little odd that you spent so much studying this is that 60 to 85 percent of projects fail to meet one of their three primary objectives. You're thinking if we have so much, if we have PIMBOX and so much of this body of knowledge regarding the topic and so many ways of estimating, why are there so many different ways projects can go wrong? So understand that the majority of the time you'll spend as a project manager is spent managing the risk associated with it. So, um, because when do you know with absolute certainty the budget or the schedule of a project? At the end. After it's done, right? Not till after it's completely finished. Up until that point, we're still tweaking and making adjustments to the process. So let's start off with saying what is a budget? So if you had to say, Brian, if I had, not to put you on the spot, but um, in your mind, what is a budget? The amount of money it takes you to complete a project? Yeah, it's just a plan for allocating resources to the project. It's that straightforward. It's just a plan for allocating resources to the project. So you already knew that. Allocating what? Resources. 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 To the project? Yep. So we said in the first three chapters that how we get to the point of developing a plan is by putting together <laughs> what? What do we put together? What's our 
a list of activities. When you create a list of all the activities you need to do, what do we refer to that as? Work breakdown schedule? That's exactly right. It's your work breakdown structure. So all the budget is, is that work breakdown structure expressed in monetary terms. That was budget? Yep. Are you recording this? <laughs> I'm kidding. I am recording. Okay. I think that helps so I don't forget. <laughs> you said in monetary terms. Do you have a question, Kofi? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, but I don't get to the first question. What is a budget? All the budget, all a budget is, we said, it is the work breakdown structure expressed in monetary terms. Or another way of saying that is it's a plan for allocating resources to project activities. <coughs> so we talked about back in the first three chapters, we talked too about the differences between between when and how people recognize expenses. Recall what we said, when does the project manager recognize an expense? Um, it's in the, when he feels, he feels the need. When the commitment's made. Yes. Right. Was this, project, was that the day when we talked about different um, like when we talked about budgeting where different departments see things differently. That's exactly where we're going with this. So the question is, when is an expense recognized? Well, we say the accountant recognizes it when they get the bill, right? When the invoice is received. The company controller recognizes it based on cash flow. When the expense is actually incurred. And then the project manager, as we said, recognizes it when the commitment is made. So commitment would typically be like a contract or an agreement with the company. When you've defined your scope and you've received the business name. So, overhead and direct charges, understand that both should be assigned to the project. And then, oh good, Amanda, glad you're here. And then what's the difference between overhead and indirect charges and direct charges? What would an example of overhead? Um, like a electricity, electricity. Yes, anything that is required to keep your building operating, whether you have a software development project or not, you have to have some amount of heat to the building or your pipes will burst, right? So that becomes overhead. Now, if you allocate it differently based on your objectives, you might say, and I worked for a boss who did this, you have 40% of the accounts in the office, 40% of the revenue potential, so I'm going to assign 40% of the overhead charges to your department. So how you account for it might be different based on your philosophy within your company organization. But we talk a little bit later about the pros and cons to having labor pools versus direct labor, and direct labor would be, I have hired you as an electrician to do eight hours worth of work. That's a direct charge to this project. Okay. Can we say that uh, direct charge is some, something a, a charge which is traceable to a specific activity? Yes. Can trace to this one? Yes where overhead might be something split between multiple departments 
And there will be a quantitative question relate that, but it's multiple choice, once again. So just ask you to determine indirect and overhead charges. It's straightforward. Easier than anything you would have had in accounting class. Okay, here, uh, will you please give uh, a, direct, a direct illustration of an indirect charge? An indirect charge yes. uh, might be something like tax preparation services for the year. It's not directly related to your project, okay. but it's an expense you have to incur, or your professional licensing. It's required in order for you to be in business, but it's not directly a line item reflect, reflecting this project, for example. If Bill Brewer has a license he has to maintain as architect, it wouldn't be directly assignable to any specific portion of the project. Now we talked at length. I think you even write in this a question on the difference between top down and bottom up. No? Do we have a question on that? Maybe in one of our case studies we did. Um, most, most project managers use top down. Why? Because they think they know everything. <laughs> uh, for that one, I believe sometimes they feel like whenever they they give the opportunity to team members or cross function team to do the budgeting, maybe they might be uh, overlooking the task or uh, um, a kind of. The manager uh, does not have, you know, does not trust the team. Uh, that is one possibility. Or uh, maybe they are taking away from him his authority. Yeah. yeah. I think those are all valid reasons. We say overall they have a more global perspective of the company. Um, now we say top up. Or bottom up, excuse me. Bottom up budgeting can be more accurate on individual elements, mm -hmm. on individual elements. But top, but top down is more generally heckled used for the big picture. There is an example in the textbook that I find so entertaining um, that talked about a company that produced airplane parts. <laughs> Okay, and then the example of the company that produced airplane parts, they found they had a project that they went over budget on, or they were late on, one of the two, I can't remember. And they ended up firing the purchasing manager over it, and the assistant got his job. And then they never won another bid for a number of years. And they went and investigated why, and they found out it was because that assistant had added 10% to the cost of everything, because he felt he was so afraid because he'd seen his boss be fired over it that he felt like he needed that buffer, that contingency, in place in order to, to preserve his job. And as a result, they never want another bid. So it's really tricky. That's why people have a tendency to overflate individual requirements. It's kind of covering up, right? So we're talking about in this chapter the difference between activity budgets and program budgets. And we say activity budgets are based on historical data, they're usually line budgets, it's the traditional organizational budget. I know when I was responsible for managing outside offices, Every year when it came to budget time, I would take a look at last year's budget, compare it to our actual expenditures, and then adjust based on that. For example, when our heating costs went way up, and I saw I had budgeted $1,200 a year for heating, <coughs> but we had a colder than average winter, and the price had gone up, so we ended up spending $1,500. 
in the next year, what did I set my budget for heating expense at? Twelve hundred. Fifteen hundred, right? Because I said, wait, the cost of the trend is that this cost is going up, so I need to allocate on an organizational basis, on a line item basis, additional funds for the next year. So it was based on my historical perspective. Okay. The program budgets, on the other hand, aggregate income and expense across task lines and your expected time frame of expenditure. We also take into consideration with program budgets the expected time frame of the expenditure. In the case of a program budget, I might know here in the Midwest that my overhead or my cost of heating is much higher in January, February, and March. So if my project takes place during June, July, and August, I might know that even though I have an organizational budget of $1,500 for heating, I don't need to have a heating line item for those three months. Does that make sense? Unless we experience global cooling on the same basis that we're talking about global warming. So do you see the distinction? Uh, will you please repeat? What's that? Will you please repeat the explanation? Yes, I certainly will. Activity budgets are based on historical data. They're aggregated by department, like your phone charges. The example I used was heating. So this is your traditional organizational budget. I might know that I spent X amount of dollars for phone charges last year I'm going to expect it to be the same this year, or, or I might say the same plus 5% if there's a known increase. Okay. That's an organizational type activity budget. A program budget takes into account the expected time of expenditure. Okay. We might assign it even to specific tasks. What do we know about learning curve? Machines don't learn, people do. I said that a lot, didn't I? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. the, we can define that one as a, the improvement of level or the qualification of a, um, employee when repeating the same activity. <coughs> For instance, if I take two hours to perform this type of activity the first time, yes, maybe the second time, maybe I can spend uh, one hour 45 minutes, later on maybe one hour 30, and then based on the time, you know, I'm still improving, so the right. time spent is decreasing. Right. The opposite of that is something the textbook refers to as the mythical man month. You don't need to write that down because doesn't show up on the exam. But they say when people say, oh, I have six design engineers and we got double the business, I'm going to go out and hire another six and we'll get it done. And that's not true because why, Amanda? Because not everybody's trained the same way. They don't have anybody trained the same way. They don't understand how our specific tools of our company work. They haven't been around the project long enough to have a historical understanding of it. So that's considered a mythical man month, and that's the opposite of this learning curve theory. Now, what you've gotten loud and clear is, uh, is that it applies to people and not machines. What you might not have picked up intuitively unless you read the chapter is that it specifically refers to when production doubles, okay? So the actual definition is your performance will improve by a fixed percentage each time labor 
doubles. Isn't it like a bell learning curve or something like that too? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Are we going to have this complicated uh, question and like to calculate something? We got to do that with learning curve. I think there's a pretty, yeah, there it is. But it's a fairly simple one. Fairly, fairly straightforward, maybe. So what's tracking signal then? A tracking signal is something, now remember, we're talking about budgeting this chapter, that shows you both your bias and the severity of your bias, meaning the difference between what you've budgeted and you've actually accomplished. So if I say, I have, expect to use 100 labor hours on this project, and I'm 40% of the way through the project, and at this point in time, I would have expected to have used 40% of the labor hours, but I've really used 80, then there's a severe difference between the two. So your tracking signal allows you to identify where you have major differences in actual versus budgeted, as well as to recognize bias. The biggest number of questions in this chat for come out of the topic of risk. And once again, why? Why would the most questions, and they're not hard questions, they're straightforward. But it's because of what I said up front, if 65% to 80% of the projects we do today fail to reach their objectives, then risk is probably the most important topic we can cover. It says that a lot of what we do is contingency for that risk. Here's an illustration that says it better than I ever could. So I'm going to quote this right from page 129 in this chapter. And this illustrates the issue. Such so that projects such as writing software require that every element work 100% correctly for the final product to perform to its specification. In programming software, if there are a thousand lines of code and each line has a 0.999 probability of being accurate, that sounds pretty doggone good, doesn't it? But if you do the math, the likelihood of the final program working is only 37%. So what we're saying is that oftentimes we have a required accuracy that is so precise that it makes that risk element very important, okay? You can never completely eliminate <coughs> uncertainty. Since we are living in a, a world of the risk of uncertainty, so we can not expect something completed with a perfection, with a, a probability of one, so so there is a kind of a deviation or not a deviation, but uh, whenever we put men uh, in part of doing something, hopefully we can expect a, a little deviation from the expectation. Yes. So while it's a, so while you could never completely eliminate some variation from the expectation. The other point is, the closer you get to project completion, the more accurate your estimates are going to be, the closer yeah. you can define that project and the actual results of it. So uncertainty diminishes the closer you come to completion. Now the textbook devotes a little bit of time to the subject of disasters. We saw in the case of the Dubai project that they had the impact of the earthquake. Some of us would say <laughs> that they should have anticipated that because they're in a known earthquake zone. But when you look at the magnitude of the disaster what you're typically looking at is what is the magnitude of the impact if it happens times the prob 
probability of it occurring. So something can have a huge impact, but very low probability of occurring, and you're not gonna factor that into the project. But the flip side is even a marginal disaster, if you can use the word disaster to mean something lesser than a full-fledged mudslide, like we saw in Washington, even if the total cost of it is less than an earthquake in Chile, if the probability of it happening is higher, then that says it has higher total cost in terms of project risk. Any questions about that? That really makes sense if you stop and think about it intuitively. So it might sound a little confusing, but it's not. Okay, so what are reasons for change? Some of these, and here's the other thing. Sometimes you can't avoid. We say plan, 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 and we some say some of our frustration with both the Dubai project and with the Big Dig project in Boston appeared to be lack of planning. But there are reasons that no matter how well you plan for something, you have to change, take into account a change or risk that your project won't be complete on time. The one most obvious one that we talk about is a mandate, a law changes. You have something you have absolutely no control over. The law changes and suddenly, if you're John Deere, you have to put different emissions on your tractors to avoid polluting the air. You're gonna incur that cost whether there's a cost benefit to it or not or whether it delays your project, your new design completion or not. You have no choice, it's a legal mandate. I thought that was thunder, but I think it's just that truck. All right, the other reason is uh, you have inaccurate estimates. Like, for example, you go to put in a normal foundation, you have done all the correct pre-engineering work, and then you find out that you're building on a fault line, so you have to reinforce that foundation. So that's an example of something you might discover after you've started with the project. So a change also can occur if you've started with the project due to discovering an unknown factor, an unknown quantity. And then the third reason the textbook states is you might just learn more as you go away. If your project is to develop a new pharmaceutical drug or a new medical device, for example, and you're two thirds of the way through the project and you say, wow, this has a use that we couldn't possibly have anticipated, a great benefit to society that we couldn't possibly have anticipated when we first wrote our project scope, then that would be a legitimate. So all projects are carried out with uncertainty. See, a lot of these statements I'm making are really straightforward and make sense to you. You know, got that one right, got that one right, right? You just check them off in your mind. Thinking, oh, okay, this seems easier than I thought it was going to be. Okay. All right, so remember, when we talk about risk, the expected cost of a risk, okay, is going to be your estimated cost times the probability of it occurring. Okay, your expected cost would be equal to your estimated cost times the probability. Estimated cost times the probability of it occurring, yeah. And that, guys, is chapter four. It's something they call the expectation of the expected value Expected value, yeah. yeah. I said estimated times probability. 
probability. Okay, so then we talk about scheduling. A, a project schedule, here's another thing. It's really straightforward. All a project schedule is. We already said that a project budget is nothing more than a work breakdown structure expressed in monetary terms. Okay, well project schedule is that just that straightforward. All it is is the action plan converted to a timetable. The action plan converted to a timetable. Then we, we did a couple of examples of drawing networks. We said there were arrow on network. Arrow and network, we say either can be used. One shows the activity on the network, the other shows the activity on the arrow. That's the only difference. We usually use activity on network because it's easier to draw. It's easier to see visually. There's really no difference. And what we show, remember when you're drawing networks, that your shortest time to completion is equal to your longest path through the network. Shortest time to completion is equal to longest path through the network. CPM, you know, we might use Gantt charts for everything because Gantt charts are really simple to use, right? We're just taking our work breakdown structure and putting on a, in a different format that shows schedule. But we use PERT and CPM because it's easier to see dependencies, those precedent relationships. That's the value in PERT and CPM, is the ability to see dependencies. Now the flip chart of that is, or the flip side of that, I mean, not the flip chart, Gantt charts are really easy to draw. They're easy to use. We can show actual progress, current progress, scheduled milestones. We can show all those things except for the variance of the critical path. So once again, the one thing we're missing is the ability to show those technical dependencies. <coughs> So what's a milestone then? A milestone is completing a significant, well it's a significant event. We use them again in charts. Your, a milestone in your achievement this semester might be the completion of the second exam on Tuesday. What's that? Ah, okay. Activity, what's an activity? It's a task required by the project. An event is a state 
resulting from completion of one or more activities. Would you please say that on again? Yes. Yes, it's a, a state resulting from the completion of one or more activities. Now the thing that's different about an event than activities is events consume no resources or time. They're just the state resulting from the completion of activities, but they consume no resources or time. So an event, a significant event would be the completion of a project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or completion of the exam on Tuesday. And the fact that you completed it didn't consume the resources or time. It's done. Studying for it might have. Okay, what's a critical path? The shortest time to complete a The shortest time to complete a project. It's also the longest path through the network. It's the shortest time you can complete the entire project, or the longest time through the project. If something's on the critical path, it has no what? Slack. Slack. That's right. It would have no slack. So slack then is, we've got a path that isn't critical today. I've already got my foundation in place. I've got my drywall up, my walls up. So getting these desks and chairs are not on my critical path. I need to paint walls and I have all kinds of other things to do. And these are expected to get here a month before, a month before we need the building anyway. Not an issue. But then June rolls around and Han goes on strike. And we find out all the product delivery has been delayed by two months. What does that do to Bill Brewer? Financial company. And what's that? Yeah, find a new company. Yeah, find a new company and or delay. <coughs> getting of the furniture and the desk becomes the critical path. So it's really important to remember that you have to pay attention to even those activities which have slack. Because any delay in, an, in a path that's not critical today that has slack can lead to that becoming the critical path in the future. And that's why we pay attention to all of those. You're looking at me confused, Kofi. Should I say that example again? Yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. okay. We <coughs> have plenty of time. We're not in the least worried about getting these desks and chairs for the new building. Lots of lead time. They're scheduled to be here in June, and we don't have to have them until August. All of a sudden in May, Bill Brewer gets a call that says, Han Office Furniture Company went on strike. You're not going to get those desks till October. What's become his new longest path through the network? Uh, okay. getting, the off getting the office furniture. So even though it wasn't on the critical path, it had lots of slack, any delay in that activity, delay in an activity not on the critical path, can make that path become the critical path. Because now, unless we expect you to come in here and sit Indian's towel on the floor with a pillow, is that even appropriate to say anymore? That's probably not, is it? <laughs> yeah, you're fine. Probably not. Cross-legged. Cross-legged. Thank you. Cross I apologize. I shouldn't have said that, but I grew up saying that. On camera. What's that? You're on camera. Oh, I am too, aren't I? <laughs> okay, rewind. Rewind back that up. Because I certainly didn't mean for that. I took a best to that. Because if anybody in this room looks American, uh, now I'm really going to go over there. It's going to be right. And I'll find out. Yeah, my mother is Cherokee. <laughs> I am Choctaw. What's that? I said I am Choctaw. I'm not a Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
Okay. Does that make sense now? Did that example help? All right. So Question. understand that. Question. Yes. Is there any way we can prevent this slag affecting the the completion of the whole project or changing? Not the, unless you change the scope or the schedule. Or maybe the budget, maybe you can find another vendor and get it here in time that you have to pay twice as much. But the likelihood of finding another vendor in June that can supply all of these items, maybe you can, and it's going to cost you twice as much, so it impacts budget. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, there's a way. It'll probably impact one of the other pieces of our triad. Yeah. But sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, <coughs> maybe uh, if, for instance, Ron will not deliver the chair, but during the time you were uh, looking uh, for the, uh, the procurement time, you want to procure it, you have to study uh, the, the suppliers before and study which one is cheaper or which one can give you the best of what you need. So now one cannot do it, but maybe a company you contacted have accepted to reduce its price to supply. Yeah, well, which is one reason why it's so important to pay attention to your contracts, right? Because if Han's written their contracts to say if an event that we as a company can control impacts our ability to deliver, such as a union strike or a weather related issue, then we won't allow you to cancel your contract without paying a 25% penalty. Then suddenly the cost of switching to another company has gone up by the 25% penalty you'll pay Han, right? So we have to be really careful on how we write our contracts. And at what point in time you can make changes to them. Okay. So the other thing to understand is the amount of time a non-critical task can be delayed without delaying the entire project is what we call slack. Non-critical, we've said that before. So how are there's two ways of calculating slack, and I'm gonna write these down. Because they make sense and when you look at them as a multiple choice question. You'll be able to pick them out, but it's easier to look at them if you see them in this format. Latest start time and earliest start time, we would define as slack, right? The difference between latest start time and earliest start time, we would define as slack. The other thing you could define as slack would be the latest finish time and earliest finish time. So if someone were to ask you, for example, on the test next Tuesday, to define slack, it could be done <coughs> one of two ways, right? Ready to move on? Allocating resources. Why is allocating resources important? Because resources are important. Because they're scarce. In the absence of scarcity, we wouldn't have a full chapter devoted to resources. Okay. Allocating specific, limited resources to specific activities is what we do in the resource allocation. If, in fact, resources were not scarce, we would be concerned solely with profit maximization. Okay? If resources were not scarce, we would be concerned solely with profit maximization. Okay. The other thing to understand about resources is that 
projects compete with each other for resources. Okay, if you have multiple projects going on, they're construction projects, and you both need to excavate, you've got physical equipment to wait for. Or you've got that engineering design expertise, you've got to wait for it. But we also said that there are those types of resources that you have to wait for, that you queue for, and then there are another type of resources. And those are the resources that are consumed. So it's important to remember that resources are either consumed or not. So it might become a queuing function among competing, projects competing for resources, unless they're consumed. Because if it's raw materials, and I use that load of potatoes to make potato chips, no matter how long you wait, you can't use them again. They're gone. You can tell I taught Frito-Lay and OM today. Mm -hmm. Remember those? Okay. All right. Types of constraints. We already said that. Just understand that some resources are consumed and some are not. Some could be time constrained. We say something is time constrained if you have a schedule related deadline. Could be budget constrained if you have a limited number of dollars. Say you could find, find Kofi, that you could get these desks and chairs from another vendor but they cost twice as much and they were outside of your budget. It wouldn't matter how quickly they could get them here if you didn't have the funds for it. Unless you're the government and then you, well, we are the government. So they can, never mind. They can pay twice as much and somehow it'll get paid for. That was a, that was facetious, sorry. Okay. Pseudo activities. Pseudo activities are activities that have duration but do not require resources. Can you give an example? Yes. You have to wait for the cement to dry. Don't doesn't require any more labor. Doesn't require any more resources, but you can't start the next activity until it happens. So crashing is important to recognize when we talk about crashing that not all projects can be crashed. Not all can be crashed. Some can be partially crashed. We already said it's not beneficial to crash an activity if it's not on the critical path. And then the other thing we said in multiple ways is you always crash the least costly first. Do, do we crash the activity on the critical path? You wouldn't have, unless it didn't, unless it, unless it didn't consume any resources, you would have no reason to crash an activity not on the critical path. If you have something, but if you have just extra time laying around, and you say, it's not on the critical path, but I can get it done today and free up that resource for another project, you might want to do it but not for the purposes of completing your project. That's where you want an overall, someone looking at the overall program of projects. So what's fast tracking? We said last time when we covered this chapter that it's used primarily in the construction industry. And it's where, or any place where you have a template, where you have a really pretty good solid idea what the routine work elements are going to be. You've done it enough times. 
that you understand that it's okay to start digging the foundation before you have all the planning completed. Because you've built enough 2,000 square foot homes to know what the foundation needs to look like. And it's okay to wait and let Rachel pick up her doorknobs later or her cabinets. So usually where it's routine work that follows a template, it's okay to fast track. For other types of projects, not so good, right? Because you don't know what you're gonna uncover. Okay. Resource loading is the amount of specific resources that are scheduled for use on specific activities at specific times. That's a lot of specifics. So let me say that again. Okay. It's the amount of specific resources scheduled for use on specific activities at specific times. The Microsoft Project allows you to have an individual availability calendar for each resource. So you would never sit down and do the resource allocation of a major project by hand. You would use some tool. You'd write yourself an Excel spreadsheet or you'd use Microsoft Project. But understand that it allows you by element to assign a specific resource. Okay, and here's another uh, point that this chapter makes. In general, in general, if you have multiple projects going on, steady state employment is desirable, which says we want to have an employment pool so we know that resource is available. So I, for example, this is one of the reasons why Bill Brewer wouldn't go out and hire electricians and put them on Western Illinois University payroll when it's time to do the electrical work over there. We're better off contracting, it makes more economical sense and training sense to go out and hire an electric, electrical contractor. Who knows, if I don't have the raw materials or they didn't get step A done yesterday, I have another work site to send my electrician to today so I can create a more steady pool of labor, employment, and availability. Generally accepted to be better. Then there's priority rules. And we, this is a review for all of you from OM. We talked about things like shortest, whether you do shortest duration first, we said, Conventional wisdom say, students assign which priority rule? They do everything based on expected due date, especially if you're my 16 year old son. You can find the expected due date of the project and then you move backwards and find out the last possible time you can start that and get it completed. 2 a.m. <laughs> you and he would get along very well. We have other priority rules. For example, what would shortest duration? If you were scheduling projects based on duration, what would that say? What would your goal be if you were short scheduling all your projects based the on the most complete? What's that? Get more the most. The most. Complete. Yeah, you would maximize the number of projects you complete. If your priority rule is based on shortest duration. Overall, when we're talking about project management, we say the priority rule we usually use is a minimum slack. Minimum slack. And that makes sense intuitively if you think about it. You'd want to first approach those projects which have the least amount of slack so that you'd have some contingency down the road if you needed it. Normal task duration is the same thing as standard practice resource usage. And 
then how are you going to determine your priority rules? Well, you can review. I, I suggest look at that section. It'll be worth your time to look at that section of the textbook. But understand that you're going to look at things when you're looking at priority rules to use. Things like schedule slippage, which are resource utilization. What kind of in-process inventory do you have? Those are all dynamic indicators of which priority rule would make the most sense for you to employ. Line balancing. That's where you look to take individual production lines and generate the required amount of product with as little excess capacity as possible. You want to schedule to maximize your use of people or machine. So it's done to generate the required amount of product with as little excess capacity as possible. What's that? One more time. Please. One more time, okay. All right. You want to set your individual production lines, all right, to generate the required product with as little excess capacity as possible. And then what is multitasking? Doing more than one activity. <laughs> <laughs> you know that, right? Nobody knows how to multitask as well as students, right? Completing multiple activities or assigning team members to multiple tasks in the case of project management. I might assign you to multiple tasks. Because anyone who's ever had an actual work description knows that other duties as assigned can easily become the most important part of your job description. All right, now I'm going to predict that you're all going to score very well on this test. <laughs> I am. So what is the probability if you expect or you What's the probability? Yeah. I, there, I really believe that this is a very comprehensive study guide. So if you're comfortable with what we've said today, or if you're brave enough to listen to it again, Amanda's got a recording of it. But I'm very comfortable that if it's not on the study guide, or we haven't talked about it today, it won't show up on the exam. So the probability of doing really well, I would say, Koki, there's a direct correlation towards your comfort with the terms and concepts we've talked about here today. Fair enough? So, Amanda, when are you going to start studying for this? When is it? Next Tuesday. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Good morning. You don't have to answer that. I'm just teasing. Okay. I might I might type it up. She might okay. I know you're I know you all have other priorities and other schedules and I know that you're all very busy. I do I do appreciate the fact that you guys are working and have other classes. Now having said that, don't forget to contact me anyway. Text is fine, voice or my cell phone's fine, email's fine, and have any questions or there's anything I can do. I will view um, this as a success if you all demonstrate you understand the material. I know I've done my job. So after this, after this exam, we have only two chapters left, right? It gets really easy. Maybe. Is the last test 100 questions? Too? No. <laughs> it's not. This is, you know what? You might think I'm nuts. But I, I think I like the structure of this class better than any other class I teach. Because the first three chapters lend themselves to that all that writing you did. Because having done that writing, 
you really have a good understanding of the overall discipline of project management. The bulk of the meat of the class takes place in chapters four through six. And that's why by design, even though they're not designed to be tricky or difficult, there are more specific questions. Chapter seven and eight, in my opinion, are pretty breezy. And then you have your presentations. So I would say the next exam 